Hi guys, welcome back for episode 60 of the weekly playback. I only played five games in the last week. I did attempt to play a game solo, but Toffee just would not allow for that. He just kept on wanting to push the pieces everywhere. So yeah, it did not happen. I ended up putting the game away. So I will talk about the five games that I played in the last week, and the first of which is Blazon. And again, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. I don't know if it's Blazon or Blazon but whatever. It's a 2023 game for two to four players designed by David Conklin and the art is done by Eno Tool and it is published by 25th Celtics. 25th century games. Now this is a game about heraldry and heraldry refers to the design display and study of armorial bearings, a shield used to identify a person or family. It says the concepts and systems of regular heraldic designs were de developed by heraldic officers between 1000 and 1300 AD during a period known as the High Middle Ages. So um, I will say that I like the feel of the rule book, but the rule book itself sucked and I will go into why it sucked. <laughs> but um, anyway, so here is the main board that you have. And on top of this are gonna be different scoring cards. So let me just pull those out. I will post pictures, um, but where are those cards? Cause actually here they are. So. It's kind of cool the way you tuck them under the board because after you tuck them under, like you're going to have it look like kind of like this. And so people can put their like own like little tokens inside these things, which is, you know, so your cubes fit nicely inside whatever those things are called. I don't know, ridges, I don't know. Um, anyway, so yeah, you're going to have like different end game scoring cards that are tucked in under there. And the reason that the rulebook really, really sucks is because none of these cards are explained in the rulebook. There's like no index explaining what any of these mean. So like you just had to guess for some of them. So I mean, we kind of figured out what they mean, but it would have been nice if the rulebook like gave some examples and explained what each and every single card meant. But I guess they wanted to save on paper, so that's why they didn't explain any of these end game scoring cards. And I really dislike when games do that, where they just don't explain what certain things mean. Just do not like that. But otherwise, the rulebook feels nice. It's nice linen paper. <laughs> okay, so that is the main board. And it also explains like your different actions that you can take. And then it also explains down here like what the end game scoring uh, will be. So on one side, you're going to have one deck of cards and on another side, you're going to have a different deck of cards. So there's two different types of decks of cards in this game. So like one deck is going to look like this. Um, I don't remember the exact terms. Let me see what they're called. I guess it's not really important. So these are device cards. The ones with the blue are device cards and they're always going to have um, squares in the corner of the different icons. And then the other deck is called tincture cards. Um, again, I don't know what tincture even means, but that's what they're called. So the one that's like a light orange peachy color, those are tincture cards, and they are going to have circles in the corners. And all different designs with like different artwork and different like, you know, symbols in the corner. So a card is going to have an element type. So the element type is the thing in the corner. So that's going to be the design in the corner. Then it's going to have an augmentation. Um, some cards indicate an augmentation. Um, so for example, like, like this one, um, the crown is its augmentation. And then you're going to have the prestige value, like the number of points it's worth. And then, um, some cards can only be positioned in certain places on the board and so the card itself will indicate that. So on each individual player board you're going to see that some place, some shields can only be placed in certain spots. So like for example in this spot you can only place a card of this um, uh, symbol or of this one and you decide. So when you put that card there um, so like, for example, if I'm putting this card here, then I'm going to have it covering up the bottom part. The thing about this game is as you start placing cards, you know, you're taking your turn and on your action, for your action, you can either pick a card or 
Um, you can do a blazon action where you actually put down a card from your hand into your shield. So you will be deciding as you go along where to place them. But once you place a card, like if I place, if I decide to cover up the bottom, then all the cards have to have that like placement. So uh, going forward, I won't be able to then play a card of this symbol or this one because I'll have to cover those up. So you're going to have to have the same placement. You can cover up cards that you've previously um, played. So that is something you can do. Um, so yeah, so basically you have like different actions. Um, so you're going to basically be picking a card during your turn, which is the acquire action. So you, there's going to be some cards face up underneath each deck. So you can take from those. Um, so you can draw two element cards from either the tincture deck, device deck, or one from each. And then you may keep both of these cards, sorry, you're drawing from the deck, or you can exchange one or both of them from the face up display. Um, so that's what you can do. So that's the acquire action, or you can take the blazon action where you're actually placing a card onto your board. Um, and then you have to discard any number of cards from your hand of which the combined prestige value uh, equals or exceeds the prestige value of the element card that you just pl placed. So if I place this onto my board, then I'm going to have to discard um, cards from my hand that equal or exceed two. Um, so you always have to have more cards in your hand so that you can actually place down cards onto your board. Um, and then again, there are different you know, placement rules as well as to how you place them. Like for example, for tincture cards, you have to, you cannot have the same tincture symbol on any of these three cards or these two cards. So um, otherwise there really weren't that many uh, restrictions, but again, you are restricted by um, what some of these have on the board already. And then um, that will also, you know, come into play like during end game scoring. So like some of the end game scoring, well, actually they're not end game, they're throughout the game, um, the objectives that you're trying to achieve. Some of them will have like one symbol or the other. And then you realize as you're playing, oh, maybe I should have gone for that card instead of that one because it would have been worth more points. Like for example, this one would require you to have this symbol, this symbol, and this symbol, in which case, um, you would be covering up like probably this diamond. Um, well, actually, so no, if you, yeah, so you would, no, actually you'd want to cover up this horse because if you need the horse and the diamond, um, then no, uh, you would be covering up this, you'd be covering up this horse so that you can get both the diamond and this horse. So you would, yeah, so you would need to kind of plan in advance like what, which cards you're going to play da place down so that you can score these um, prestige, pre you know, these bonuses throughout the game. Um, what else? Do 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 do. You, um, if someone like, um, as they're playing, like, so you're scoring your prestige as you're playing, whenever someone passes one of these like big spaces, then the other player gets a um, ink token. I don't know exactly what they're called, but gets one of these like ink pots with a feather in it. And then you can use those on your turn for a special action, like at any point during your turn. And those can be pretty useful actually. So those are good. Um, yeah, it's a pretty simple game. It's the, you know, there's nothing super complicated going on here. You're just taking one action or the other and then just placing a card and yeah, and that's really it. And then you're just scoring and you know, the Herald actions, um, which is what you use those tokens for, um, can be pretty useful. So, but yeah, but that's basically it. Um, again, nothing super, you know, um, complicated here. It does come with really nice components. Um, you know, these really weren't necessary. So if you're the first person who passes one of those major uh, points on the board, you will get one of these um, these statues or whatever they're called. And those are worth, I believe, five points each at the end of the game. They serve no other function, really. They're just something you just collect and then they're just worth points at the end of the game. So they're super nice. Um, probably increased like, you know, the value, the cost of this game, but they really serve no other purpose other than to just give you some points if you collect it. So that is it. So yeah, so that's basically the game. It's a pretty simple game. It's pretty to look at. The cards, you know, the components are really nice. Everything feels really nice. Um, the artwork is really nice, but it's not a complicated game by any means. Um, depending on player count, you will use one side or the other. So I played a two player game of it. So that's why we use this side, but yeah. 
Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, there, I guess there is a way to maybe make the game a little bit more complex. It comes with these ink splatter uh, tokens, which we did not use. Um, but maybe that's a way to make the game a bit more interesting. So maybe if we play it again, we'll play with those and see if that makes it a bit more interesting than it is. So yeah, so that is Blazon, which again was good, um, but the rule book sucked. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, I feel like they should come out with a sheet that explains all of the cards and just upload it onto BGG for people to be able to download or refer to. Um, so they are not sitting there just trying to figure out what certain things mean. Um, yeah. So let me just put this away. Nice player colors though. So it comes with black, like this green color, this light blue color, and then pink. Yeah. Okay, the next game we shall talk about is, let me just put this on the ground, is Galaxy Trucker. Let's talk about Galaxy Trucker. So this was my first time playing this game. So Galaxy Trucker originally came out in 2007. I have the second edition, which is a 2021, and it is designed by Vlada Schwatel, and the art is done by, oh God, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce that, Tomas. Kujorovsky and um, it's published by Czech Games and it's for two to four players. This is a real-time tile placement game and oh my god it is so stressful. <laughs> so um, there's like a billion components in this. I feel like this game could really do with an insert. It's just got like a billion baggies but I think that's just the way Czech Games does their boxes. Like they just uh, have boxes without any inserts and just a billion bags. Yeah. So you ha are going to have um, like this one main board at the top and depending on player count, I guess you will use um, one of these. I think it depends on player count. I used, um, we played with my friend's copy and I actually don't, wasn't paying much during, paying much attention during setup, but I'm assuming, or actually no, I think um, different boards are for different rounds. Yeah, so like this is the round one board and then I think you have different yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you use different boards for different rounds. And then your own ship, you are also going to have like different boards for different rounds. So this is the top of your ship and then this is the bottom. So this is a ship that you're using in round one or the board that you're creating your ship on rather. And this, this is the one for round two and I believe this is the top and this is the bottom. And you'll also see numbers along the top and the side which uh, become relevant when you are playing for various attacks that will happen. And then this is the board for round three which is much bigger. Um, so basically you are going to have the sand timer and you are going to have a bunch of different upside down tiles and you need to place different tiles onto your ship, your board, in order to make a ship. So you know there's different things like you have guns that you need to shoot, you have these storage things for what you need in order to collect different ki times, kinds of good. Of course you need batteries if you are going to have a ship and you want to move it. Um, I cannot find a battery right now. Here is a shield. So you're going to need shields in order to protect, protect your ship from attacks from various locations. You are going to need these, like, I guess they're called thrusters or whatever. So those are what, which will like propel your ship. So you're going to place those at like the bottom of your ship. And of course you can't have anything else like behind it. Um, and same with like the guns. Like if you have a gun pointing this way, you can't have something in front of it that it would shoot. Um, so yeah, so there are different placement rules for everything. Um, there are these like special tiles that will allow you to, uh, so you have like crew member tiles like these, but then you can also harbor aliens or like bring on aliens. I don't know if I can find an alien part right now, but there are different tiles that will allow you to get aliens, but they need to be placed directly next to these ones that hold crew members. And I just cannot, oh, here's one that would hold a brown alien. So like this one would hold like a brown alien. So yeah, so there's all different kinds of parts. And of course, you again, you need batteries in order to perform different functions. And after you've assembled your ship, you will actually place these different battery tokens right onto these. Um, and then you'll be removing them as you take different actions uh, when you're resolving the event cards. So like here are the different aliens. Here are the crew members, which are super duper cute. Like they're really cute. Yeah, 
I'm check them out. <laughs> They've got like a little backpack. They're just so cute. They've got like little ears. I know it's probably hard to see here, but they've got like little backpacks. They're just really, really adorable. Um, so yeah, um, when it comes with these tiles, I don't know what these are. Maybe these were used for a higher, like for some expansion or something. I don't know what these are. We didn't play with these, um, but yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so you're going to have different event cards. So after you're done uh, creating your ship, so in round one, you will have one timer and then um, once the timer runs out, another player can then flip it over. So you actually have two timers um, in round one, then in round three, you have three timers, and then in round four, you have four timers to be able to use to construct your ship. Um, since it was my first time playing and my friend had played a number of times, he played with a handicap. So in all the rounds, he used simply one timer while I would get to use all the timers that were available for that round uh, in order to construct my ship. And um, when you're constructing a ship, you turn a tile, when you pick up a tile from the pool, you turn it face up on above your board, and then you decide whether or not you want to place it, and then you can put it down if you don't want to place it then. And any tile you put back in the pool face up can then be taken by another player instead. Um, so yeah, it's like really like, um, it's really like, um, anxiety inducing i would say uh playing this game like i just even with my all the timers i had and my opponent just having one i still felt like like really panicked and like i wouldn't be able to construct a good ship so yeah um what else oh yeah here's the starting like main center tile for each player and of course you have to be mindful of pipe connections so after the timers are finished you are going to examine everyone's ship and make sure that they don't break any rules if they break rules then you take the tiles that broke the rules and place them up here in this box and they will be worth minus one point at the end of the game and as you're resolving the different events you might lose parts of your ship like parts might just break off because they are in the line of fire and you didn't have a ship to protect them or something like that and any parts that break off will also go here and will be worth minus one point at the end of that round or credits so you're basically collecting these credits and then whoever has the most at the end of the game will win so that is essentially the game let me just show you some of the uh, event cards that might come up and so it'll tell you like the different requirements that you need to resolve them and you're also going to be uh, moving around on this board so, you know, on the main board, you'll be moving around your spaceship. Um, so yeah, so that is uh, essentially Galaxy Trucker. It is a very fast paced um, game that, you know, if you feel like you don't do well under pressure, then I do not think this game is for you. You might just feel like just panicked and just, yeah, it just might cause a lot of anxiety for you. <laughs> so, so, you know, I feel like um, it's a game that I'm always going to suck at and it's always going to just make me feel anxious, but I don't know. I don't know if this is a game I'll hang on to or not. Like that's something I'm still going to decide. I might want to play it a couple more times, but um, real time games, like, you know, they just make me feel really anxious and I nervous. So I, I don't know if I'll hang on to it, but I bought this on sale when it was on sale at Barnes and Noble. So um, probably should have waited until their really big sale because I still paid, I think I was on sale like 25% off, but then Barnes and Noble like weeks or months later had that really big sale. So I probably should have waited until that, but oh well. Anyway, um, moving on. So let's talk about um, the other game that I actually have in person that I played is The Little Prince. I've talked about this game uh, several times before, so I won't go into detail. It is an out of print game. Um, it's designed by Antoine Bauza and Bruna Cathala, and it's just like you're creating a planet from different tiles. Um, though this game, this time I did play a two player game of it rather than a multiplayer game. The two player game is interesting because um, you, so you have different piles of tiles piles of tiles <laughs> so let me just show you so you know you're going to have four different piles of tiles and you are trying to create a planet so you have the planet tiles and then you have the outside tiles and on these tiles there's going to be different things and you are going to have four characters at the end of the game which will be in the corners of your universe 
and those will be how you score. So in a two player game, the player who is the active player will basically select three tiles from one of these four groups, look at all three, put two of them face up and one face down, and then the other player gets to select which tile they want first. Um, so, you know, obviously they can't look at the face down one, but they can look at the two face up ones and then decide which one they want. Um, so, you know, you kind of have to kind of figure out like what your opponent usually does. Does your opponent usually put the thing that they want face down or do they put the thing that they want to screw you over with face down so that you might pick that? Um, I felt like I just kept on getting screwed over. Like my opponent um, just kept on figuring out which one I was doing, like whether I was putting, you know, something to screw him over face down or something that I wanted face down. Um, so yeah, so I ended up with scoring tiles, which weren't that great, which again are the different characters that you put in the cor corner and you'll have four of them. And of course there are different like things on these planets, like there's like volcanoes and like, um, you know, there could be those boobob trees, which you know could cost you points. So yeah, it's just a tile placement game. It's a nice little game. So at the end of the game, your planet ends up looking something like this. And then you have your four scoring characters in the corner. So yeah, again, this is an out of print game, so it might be a little bit harder to find. I really wanted this game after the first time I played it last year because, um, Maybe it was more than a year ago, I can't remember, because I'm a huge fan of The Little Prince. Um, I actually wrote a paper on The Little Prince in grad school, um, not law school, the grad school I went to before law school. So when I was trying to, going for a PhD in Middle Eastern studies, but I ended up leaving with just a master's. But anyway, I wrote a paper on The Little Prince in which I examined the themes of The Little Prince and how a lot of the themes in that book um, are present in Sufism, which is the mystical like sect branch of Islam. So, you know, I wrote a paper theorizing like what, whether he, the author, had any Sufi influences from his time that he spent in Algeria. So yeah, anyway, my professor really liked the paper. She thought it was very original. So yeah. So The Little Prince always means a lot to me. It's a really good book and I think everyone should read it. Um, Moving on, let's talk about Raiders of the North Sea, which I do not own, but I can throw up pictures. So I'm wondering if this is Shem Phillips' first game in um, out of the trilogies. I know that the North Sea trilogy was the first trilogy he did, but I'm wondering if this is the first game from that trilogy. I do not know, because compared to his other games, it's quite simple. So Raiders of the North Sea is a 2015 game for two to four players designed by Shem Phillips, and the art is done by the Micho and again published by Garfield Games. So this is a worker placement game, so you're going to have a board, and on this board are going to be different locations, and each person starts with one worker. You're going to place a worker, perform that action, and then pick up a worker worker and again perform the action from the spot that you're picking up and different spots can only have different kinds of workers and you're trying to collect up the resources you need so that you can start raiding the different parts of the board where there are more valuable things that you want to get. That is essentially the game. So you're building up your like army, I guess. I don't know if it's called an army fleet, I think is the word actually. Um, so you have different crew members and you can play them. And uh, in order to play them, you have to pay a cost to add them to your crew, but you might lose them later on if you end up getting, like sometimes when you raid a location, you'll get one of these bad tokens that will cause you to kill off a crew member. But sometimes you want to kill off a crew member but also when you're raiding you also have a strength value so you're going to look at the strength value of each character you have to see what is the likelihood of you being able to raid this location and succeed in your raid and get the highest like the loot that you want and the point values differ in each location for you know the more um, the higher the strength that it requires the more points you will probably be able to get so yeah, so that's essentially the game. You're just like going to different locations, trying to get money, trying to get various um, provisions because you need provisions as well in order to perform a raid. So once you have the required um, things that you need in order to raid, then you're going to raid. And there's different game end triggers. So in a two player game, um, which is what I played, the game end trigger that we ended up going uh, that ended up happening was that there was only like I believe one section left in the top part of the board that needed to be raided. Um, going through the bottom part of the board there's like these tiles that you can get. One of the game and triggers was that oh you can't like refill those three spaces 
that I just did not think would happen and I don't remember what the other end game trigger was but there's three different end game triggers um so yeah it's a good game it was quite simple so like if you've played Shem Phillips's more um recent games this is going to seem very simple to you but again once you learn the iconography it just is smooth sailing I really enjoyed it I thought it was a really good game um so it is a lighter game so this is something that I would probably you know introduce to people um you know bring to game nights in order to introduce people to Shem Phillips games but again it is a lighter game but still a lot of fun I, I really enjoyed my play of it yeah so that is Raiders of the North Sea um, another game that I played recently uh, I think I'm up to the last game in fact is the Fox in the Forest now this is a trick-taking game that came out in 2017 for two players um, so it's designed by Joshua uh, Bjorgel and the art is done by Jennifer Meyer and Keith Pishnery and it's published by Renegade Game Studios and Foxtrot Games. Um, there's three different suits in this game. Um, you will have one face-up card, which I believe is the um, Trump suit. So on your turn, you'll play a card and then, you know, you'll each play a card. Um, or I think uh, one person plays a card and then the other person plays a card. Um, yeah, sorry, the, the starting player plays a card and then the other person plays a card and then, and, you know, you're going to, based on who wins the trick, then that will determine who plays the next card first and so on and so forth. Um, you're playing this in a certain number of rounds and whoever gets to 21 points first, I believe, wins. Um, different cards might allow you to take different actions. Um, they may allow you to change the trump card. Um, you may play a card that then forces the other player to play their lowest uh, one value card or the whatever the highest value card is of that suit that you just played if they have it. Um, you may be able to play a losing card but then lead, uh, start the next trick. So there's different cards with different um, uh, abilities on them. It was a really good trick taking game for two players. I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it's a good game. I don't really know what else to say about it. So if you enjoy trick taking games, you might enjoy this. Um, I did know that there was a game called the Fox in the Forest duet. So before playing this, I thought that the Fox in the Forest was a multiplayer game, like three or four player game. And then the duet game was for two players, but it turns out that this is actually a two player game. So, and then I looked at Fox in the Forest duet and it turns out that that's like a cooperative trick taking game. So I guess that's what the difference is between these two, even though they're both two player trick taking games. So those were the games I played in this past week. I did go to, you know, a game night which I hadn't been to in a long time because uh, recently I've just been playing with a friend of mine just a lot of two-player games but I had gone to a game night hoping to play like multiplayer games like three or four player games but it was just me and another friend who showed up so but I'm hoping that I will start getting you know getting to play higher player account games soon because I'm still dying to play the great split and there's a few other games that I'm dying to play that need a higher player account so I hope I'll get to do that soon. Um, let's go on to games that I am backing. So I'm currently still backing Zoo Vadis. Let's see how much time that has left. Do, 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 do. It's got five days left and it is currently at $112,000. Um, and then I'm backing this print and play game for $4. It's called Pride and Prejudice. So anyone who follows me on Twitter would know that I'm a huge fan of like Pride and Prejudice and like those like period dramas. Like um, I just finished rewatching yet again Bridgerton. I think it was like my third time rewatching the entire series. So yeah, so I saw that this um, roll and write, this print and play roll and write uh, is Pride and Prejudice and they like make the D and this prejudice bigger so it's prejudice um, because you're using dice which is pretty clever um, not a huge fan of the artwork to be honest um, but you know again it's a print and play it's being self-published so I guess you can't be too critical about that <laughs> but I'm excited to play this and give it a try so yeah so that has nine days left and then I think they'll just send you the file and you can print it out yourself uh, so let's go on to games that I have received um, so I received, oh, let me hit pause on this. Actually, I'm just going to stop the video because I forgot to bring a game that I received and I need to go get it. So I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. So one of the games I received was a game that I had covered for its Kickstarter, which is Broken and Beautiful. This is the deluxe edition. This is a set collection game about uh, Kintsugi, which is the art of repairing broken pottery. Uh, broken, it's a Japanese art of repairing broken pottery with like golden lacquer. So I did end up sleeving the cards because the card, uh, 
um, quality in this uh, print, this uh, production uh, copy, I just felt like wasn't that great. If I remember correctly, I think the card quality in the prototype was actually nicer. They felt like much thicker, like glossier cards, whereas these just feel like regular, like just matte uh, thin cards. So I decided to go ahead and sleeve all of them because it is a game I enjoyed and it's got pretty cards and stuff like that. So like here are like the fronts of the um, cards and then like on the back of them, you'll see once they've been repaired. So in this game, you're trying to flip over your cards so that you get them to the repaired side so that they are worth more and again it's a set collection game so you need like certain sets of things and it has a snake draft going on which is a bit more interesting as well than just like a regular draft um, I did get rid of the insert so that my sleeved cards would fit into the box um, you know and then um, the deluxe edition comes with these really nice heavy gold nuggets and then it comes with a really pretty first player token so here i love how this player token also fits the theme of the game so it's a nice chunky metal teapot and then this side is the unbroken side and then this side is the broken side that's been repaired like i really love that i love how it fits the theme of the game it's really nice it's really beautiful um so yeah so this arrived and then of course it comes with some player aids and stuff as well so again, um, lots of cards. I just um, showed you a handful and then I took out the insert so that it all fits into this box. And I like how simple the box is, just like very simple, but nice. Um, two games that arrived recently are Anomia. So, oops, sorry for moving the camera. So Anomia is a game I had discussed before on this channel. Um, it's a party game. It's like a word game. I really enjoy this game. I'll talk about it in more detail the next time I play it, but I'm excited to have a copy of my own. It's like you have different cards with like different, like um, I didn't open the cards yet, but like for example, scientific theory. So like if you uh, have this card, you see this card, you need to like shout out a scientific theory first in order to like claim this card. What would a scientific theory be that I could shout out? Would that be like, hmm, like the Big Bang Theory? I guess that's still a theory, right? Because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's called Big Bang Theory, so I guess you could shout, shout that out. Or a famous puppet, like I guess you could shout out like Kermit. I think he's a puppet. Is Kermit the Frog a puppet? I don't know. So yeah, so um, Anomia is a really fun party game, like party word game. You need at least three players to play it, but it's super duper fun. Three to six players. So those arrived. Uh, let's move on to games that I am calling. So I have decided to call Monolith. Um, I discussed this game a long time ago when it arrived. I played it once, I played a two player game of it. And if you watch the video in which I discussed this game, which was probably months ago now, like it was, yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, I talked about how I just did not think that the theme had anything to do with uh, the mechanics of the game. The, me the theme was just kind of like plastered on, like, you know, you're supposed to be creating these like, uh, prehistoric structures and then there's like prophecies and stuff like that like it just kind of the whole theme just kind of fell flat for me I think that you know you're someone who would uh, you would enjoy this game if you enjoy working with tetra shaped blocks and you want to create actual like 3d structures from those blocks um, rather than just have a polyamino game that's like flat on your um, board but for me it just you know it was okay like I just didn't think it was that great and I just don't see a need to keep it in my collection um, yeah and like I said I just felt like the theme just really didn't have much to do with the game so I've decided to call this um, I might see if uh, it's a game that my backers would be um, my Kofi subscribers would be interested in because I do the uh, giveaway um, for board games for them. So maybe if one of them is interested in it, in it, then I'll just give it to them as part of the giveaway. So I'll probably ask them and if none of them are interested in it, then I'll just probably trade it in or get store credit for it or something like that. Um, updates. I mentioned that I was going to do a video for Starship Captains and then I totally forgot to talk about that. So um, there is a retailer that is based out of Seattle who saw like my one minute videos and so I've kind of partnered with them where they'll send me games and I'll do one minute videos for them with a link to where you can purchase the game on their website. So I'm just waiting for my affiliate link. Uh, to be able to start posting those videos. So, um, you know, I think they'll decide which games they want to send to me. 
Um, hopefully they'll send me games that I enjoy and not Munchkin. I do think that they sell Munchkin. Um, I'll just let them know that I really hate Munchkin and that's a game that I absolutely refuse to cover. <laughs> so um, we'll see. Um, so yeah, so let's see. Um, so yeah, so I just have like this small little, um, I don't know what you want to call it, partnership, whatever, with this retailer going forward uh, just to help them kind of sell some games and I'll just get these games for free and I'll be making one minute videos for them. So yeah, so that will be happening. So when I start posting those, you'll see the retailer's logo on the video as well so that you'll know it is a sponsored video and that I am being, you know, sponsored to create that video and, um, and then have the affiliate link on the bottom. So that is coming up. Um, so one of the questions I received from you guys, it's been a long time since anyone's asked me a question, but that used to be a thing about these videos where I would like open it up and let you guys ask me anything and then I would answer them. So I received, received a question recently, which was, what is my favorite start player token? Probably should have um, had it here to show you guys. <laughs> so um, it is, I'll throw up a picture of it, but it is the start player token from this game called, um, God, what is it called? It's a game that I really like. It's about wizards at a school, Runica and the Six-Sided Spellbooks. That's what it's called. Oh my God, my memory, I swear. So Runica and the Six-Sided Spellbooks has this really cool start player token that is like this orange cat with wings. Really like that. And I know I just received this game, but honestly, the start player token in this game is super nice. Like absolutely love it. Like when I saw it, I was like, oh, like that is perfect timing for this question because that is just a really gorgeous start player token. Like really really nice um yeah i don't like start player tokens that are just like eh, like um you know i guess you know of course it's gonna cost more to make a really nice start player token like if it's like a 3d um if it's a screen printed meeple i mean obviously things are 3d <laughs> so if it's a screen printed meeple obviously it's probably going to cost more or like a metal token it's going to cost more but they you know they are nicer it's nicer to pass around than just some tiny like cardboard thing so yeah um i really like the one from runica and the six sided spell books and that one is really nice um i can't recall any other games that i have that have like a super nice start player token none that come to mind so that is the question I'm going to leave you guys with actually. I want to know what your favorite start player token is for which game. Let me know and if you, if there's a way to post a picture in the comments, I don't know if there is, probably not, but I'll go look them up anyway. So yeah, so tell me what your favorite start player token is and until next time, bye.